Joining me today is professional talker, shopper, and author, Ms. Nancy Red. Nancy has read several best-selling books and award-winning books, but today we're talking about her newest children's book, which is a picture book, The Real Santa. This book is based on Nancy's son's intense efforts to catch the jolly icon in action. This picture book is a heartwarming depiction of Black family love. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Nancy to Meet the Author. How are you doing today, Nancy? I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. So yeah, you're all festive and ready for the holiday season. <laughs> I've been celebrating Christmas since summer. <laughs> also, you one of those. Oh, yes. Well, I'm one of those that as soon as Thanksgiving is over, literally the turkey is cleared, the tree goes up in a normal year. But this yeah. year, because the book was coming out, I've been doing promotional interviews you know, since, since my children the were beginning. at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. You look great in your red sweatshirt and your red Thank sweater. You. you look holiday ready. You look like the dad in the book. <laughs> oh, wow. Before we get started, can you hold up the book so everyone can take a look at totally. it? Totally. Okay, so this is my book, The Real Santa. It's available the everywhere and it's available on blackbookstore.com. That is correct. That is correct. <laughs> So it's just in time for the holidays. So if you have not picked up a copy yet, now's a great time to get a copy of this great children's book that has just come out. So what made you decide to write a, a children's book? You've written different type of books over the years, but now you got a children's book. What was the, the urge and desire to write this book? Having kids, you know, and I think when you really see the disparity in children's media, like especially how it was a decade ago when I had my first son uh, and I would look for books and they wouldn't exist. And I feel very fortunate to be able to create the books I wanted my children to read. It's funny, I think you and I are very similar because I watched an interview with you on how Rolling Out was founded because it saw all these great black musical talents not getting their due and you all specialized and now you've expanded, but you started off highlighting the undercurrent of music, you know, that's really the industry's foundation and its best talent. And in a similar vein, Black Santa has been in every Black household that celebrates Christmas for decades, but it's not been celebrated in the mainstream. So I was really excited to be able to bring the real Santa to light and to highlight the beauty of our culture and the beauty of Black Santa. And that's why I love writing picture <laughs> books because you get them young, you know, you, yes. you start off knowing that I am enough, and my Santa or my bonnet or whatever I'm writing books about, that it belongs in the mainstream. Exactly. Good for you. I, I, you did some homework. And yes, you're correct. That is kind of, that is, that is how Rolling Out started out. The key is how do we edify our people? And we've spent so many years, uh, typically you don't find them in, you know, in the mainstream publication. So why not show them at their, on their coming up? And, and this is one of those opportunities right here. Uh, for what I've seen so far, the book is great. So Tell us a little about what is the real Santa? What makes him the real Santa? Well, what's fun about this, I originally wanted to call the book Black Santa because okay. Black Santa was very exciting. But it's very interesting because my publishers were like, well, the book's not about Black Santa. And at first I was very upset. The book's about Black Santa. <laughs> <laughs> right. I do. But they were like, no, it's about Santa. Because to the protagonist, to the children, it's mm. just Santa. And I was mind blown because as you know, like we're of a different generation. So exactly. we're used to kind of a segregated situation. I'm not comfortable with it and I'm working to change it, but you know, and so, but I appreciated the opportunity. So they're like, you need a better title. And at first, again, I was like, I want Black Santa because this is my dream to have a Black Santa title. But then I thought about it and it came to me one night. I said, the real Santa, because the lifelong question for children has been, what does the real Santa look like? And the answer has never been black. And I feel very fortunate to, uh, to directly address this question with a nurturing and fulfilling answer that our kids can feel satisfied by. Awesome. I like that. I like how you said that because the, in, out of defense, the first thing is I wanted to be black. But <laughs> after pulling the lens back and looking at the full picture, it makes sense that okay i can now say it and say the same thing in a different way this is the real santa and you can say why because in the child's eye santa is just santa 
Just like mom is just mom, it's not black mom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So get tell it tell the audience a little bit about the book. Just give them a kind of synopsis of what they can expect. Are there any sight words in the book or you know, or what should what are some of the key, the key things that you would like the readers to, to take away from it? I grew up having a very sweet and nurturing family. And I, I you know, Deneen Milner, like a, maybe six or seven years ago, wrote an amazing New York Times op-ed. Black children deserve to read about more than Harriet Tubman. Basically, <laughs> can we have more than the struggle bus stories? Yes. Because at the, that time, before she had her imprint and before this movement of diversity in children's literature, a lot of our books focused around pain or struggle or strife. And that is one facet of our story and some very important ones so we don't forget where we come from so we don't repeat the mistakes or the issues. But we also have so much fun. Like my family's ridiculous and we're just all having a good time. So I really like the fact that the real Santa, it's like Bedtime Bonnet, focuses on this very happy extended family. You got grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, baby sister, and the protagonist who is this little boy who is determined to find out what the real Santa looks like. Because in his house, just like in my house, there's black Santa everywhere, but they all look different. So we address the idea of difference in appearance, uh, but with well, retaining the identity. And so he's wondering, what does the real Santa look like? And everyone's telling him that they don't know because Santa's never been seen. And he has, the, of course, the idea that my child has had, every child has had that celebrates Christmas, <laughs> that, okay, we're going to stay up and see Santa. We're going to catch this dude. And of course he doesn't. But the way he comes about realizing what the real Santa looks like is very touching and very sweet and also offers any child who's reading the book an opportunity for it to be about their own interpretation of what Santa looks like, which is what I love. So it's the blackest black Santa story, but yeah. with an air of who knows. It's very fun. OK, so so what does so what does family what would, what give us a kind of an idea of what family is going to look like for you around the holidays? We got Thanksgiving coming up. We got Christmas coming up. So using this book as our backdrop, what what kind of give us an idea of what Christmas holidays look like in your house? Right now, they look very different because I live in Los Angeles, California. My <laughs> I long for my childhood where Christmas wasn't that commercialized. Remember when the stores closed down? Yes. Yeah, they, they, it was, yes. Like, you got like, I mean, when I was going, you got like one present. You were extending some socks, but it wasn't about that. And I tried to kind of do the same thing with my kids, but um, we go back to my mom's for Christmas this year. And it's very emotional for me because we haven't gotten to go home for a couple of years because I wanted to wait until my children were vaccinated. Right. And so uh, my mom has been a trooper in this time and Christmas is her favorite holiday. So we're going to just blow out and have a great time and do all the fun decorating. And, and we're actually leaving two weeks before Christmas because Christmas, my mom always says, which I agree, it's not about the day. It's yes. about the prep. And she always says the holidays are what you make of them. So for every holiday in my house, whether it's St. Patrick's Day or Valentine's Day or Christmas or Easter, I'm decorating for a month out <laughs> beforehand because wow. those are the core memories children have. And, right. you know, that's the fun part. So, so where are you traveling to? Where are you guys going? Martinsville, Virginia. That is where oh, I'm from. Wow. I was born and raised and would live there today if I could. <laughs> so actually, so they get a chance to experience a cold, maybe a little snow winter uh, Every holiday. Every winter. So listen, my husband's Indian American and he's from New York City. So um, and so we lived in New York for a really long time. And for me, it's very important that my children know not just know Black culture, but love black culture. So right. until coronavirus, there wasn't a single summer. We didn't spend two months in Virginia and I send them all to the YMCA camp. You know, we go <laughs> to my home church. We live our, we, it's just great. And they, and because of it, they're so sound in who they are and who, where they come from. And I love it. It makes me so happy. It's raising children that know who they are and their value and worth, all of it. It's a full-time job on top of all of the other jobs. Oh, but yes, it is. I mean, <laughs> just being a mother alone is a full-time job. So, I mean, people kind of take that for granted. So being a mother, working a full-time job, have a, have a husband, taking care of the house, cooking, whatever else, 
that's a job within itself. And then on top of that, I think more now more than ever is the emotional fulfillment of your children. Yes. And that's, I didn't, that was not a priority growing up in the 80s. I don't know about you, but no. my emotions, I mean, that's what I was thinking about my emotions. Nothing personal, but no. did you have an emotional childhood? <sighs> Uh, not re- didn't have an emotional childhood, but you figured that, well, my mother was very attentive. She would l- at least listen, whereas a lot of parents would not listen, especially now you see where parents would not take time to listen to a child. And I guess because she was an educator, she would do that. She would literally get down to eye level. You know? See, look, you just said it. Okay, this is yeah. really interesting. I have a theory. My mom was an educator. My mom was a first grade school teacher. She was actually teaching a first grade class the you know night mm-hmm. day that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and it oh, was wow. a segregated school, right? Yes. So but yes. your mom was an educator. Educators know how to train children. I find so many very successful black people had educators as parents because they were trained in the way to listen. My mom listened, yes. but my emotions, like how I'm feeling inside, that was not in the vocabulary, nothing personal. <laughs> yeah, it, when you put it that way, you're correct because it would come to the point that, you know, certain words, you couldn't use the word can't, you couldn't use the word if, you know, usually, you know, you don't put a negative connotation behind something before you do it. You've already spoke negative into it. She never really spoke saying in the atmosphere, the universe, all that type of stuff. Get, can't, it, you don't use the word can't, you know, it, find another word whatever that case was. But today, educators are not the same as they were with our parents, because my mother too taught around the same time uh, in the 60s. So, so of course, she was in a segregated, you know, community. And then, uh, then she, you know, it was desegregated. So she was on both worlds. And I actually went to school with my mother. She taught me. Oh, I love that. That's so sweet. And, yeah. you know, and it, it takes that level. And, and it's really hard. I don't know how these, it was before, I mean, like it was before, it was like a, just was a lot. So the goal of that generation was to yes. make it. Emotions had to like be kind of stunted because otherwise if you start thinking too much about how the sausage is made, you've got to get off the train. And so <laughs> with this new generation though, yeah. we're seeing, you know, the New York Times just posted a, a heart-wrenching article on the rise of suicide in the black mm-hmm. community. And um, my father committed suicide, was, um, died by suicide in the 80s because he oh, wasn't wow. in touch with his feelings to talk about it. And I think it's very important that we're seeing with this next generation that we attend to their emotions, that we acknowledge yes. that they, you can't just push through feeling othered. And it starts with picture books. That is, a, a, it starts with seeing yourself from a yes. very early age with affirming pictures of people who look like you and feel like you in actual bookstores. And in actual stores, and I see so much change happening now, uh, and it's and it's it's heartwarming to me. But we've still got a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do, and and you 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 said it mouthful, but it was all correct. With your books, the books help to it's it's multifaceted. You're able to educate directly and indirectly, especially with children at a young age. What is the age range for your book? Well, what the fun thing about picture books is. On a technical level, it is from two to eight. However, okay. uh, picture books often are read by older children to their younger siblings. And also, let's be honest, it's some of these issues are very difficult for even adults to comprehend or grasp. I find the power of a picture book to be more than just for children. Because when you are talking, when you are reading 400 words on a topic versus a 40,000 word nonfiction (laughs) book, your brain doesn't turn off. So I find a lot of parents, when they're reading it to their children, are getting a lot out of it, especially with my first book, Bedtime Bonnet. (laughs) Bedtime Bonnet's hilarious because a lot of people who aren't Black have no idea about our nighttime hair rituals. And I just, when I was selling the book, (laughs) they were like, are you sure? Black women wear bonnet. I was like, I'm, I'm positive. <laughs> positive. I know. And I was like, to be honest with you, this just means you don't have any black friends. That's okay. We're going to rectify this because. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you just didn't call it. It used to be called what? A, a, a silk scarf or silk. I mean, you had the satin, no, the satin scarf, the satin scarf and then the bonnet. So we, we got it all in the book because <laughs> everybody wears different things. But, yeah. um, but anyway, yes, it's very important for 
children to see themselves and children to read about themselves and everyone of all ages can get a lot out of not just my picture book, but any picture book. If yeah. Anytime someone wants, I always say if someone is trying to learn more about larger topics, but they just don't have the energy or time, find a picture book on the topic at the library. And at least it gives you the, the gist, right? It gives you the gist to begin the journey of learning. Exactly. So when you were writing this, what uh, was it, what was the hardest part of writing this, this, this picture book? At first, when I was writing it, it was very interesting. I was a little angry because I was writing. I was just my, my protagonist, the young boy who was based off my son. He was just like, why are all the mall Santa's white and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and my, my, bless my editor. She was like, man, the children aren't angry yet. You, <laughs> yes. Like you're, 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 you're not, you're funneling your opportunity in a, in a direction <laughs> that isn't especially, it's not as powerful as it can be. And so I had to really think about it. The process was, it was uh, for me, writing is like therapy. Every book I've ever written, I come yeah. out a better person because of it, because it, it forces me to look at my own internal, my, my own internal compass and who I am and who I'm trying to be and where I've come from. So when I first got out the first draft of the little boy just being upset that like his Santa wasn't anywhere. And then I was able to finesse it into, well, where is Santa safe currently, right? And in the home. So that's why the book, the book had them going all over, going on the journey like I did, two hours away to the one place we could buy Black Santa, you know? Right. <laughs> it was, at first it was like a pilgrimage situation to find Black Santa. And then I realized, you know what? You know where Black Santa always is? In the home. And so that's why the book stays at home, which for many of us still, myself included is the safest space it's the place where you can just be yourself in your bonnet <laughs> and read your book read your book <laughs> and and i love it because you don't have any of the conflict it's just love pure joy and curiosity okay so you mentioned you you always learn something from the books you write so what did you learn from this from the real santa i learned a lot about Assuming children already have the predetermined biases that I have. And to, I learned a lot in this process in particular because Bedtime Bonnet, when I wrote that, it was all joy all the time because no one, I mean, I just love my bonnet. Like, there's, there's, no, there's no other side to the bonnet. There's no like, well, you should be doing something else. No, the bonnet is 100% great. There was no, there's no person in the media telling me, well, now there was. When I wrote the book, there wasn't the bonnet controversy. That's a whole other conversation. Um, right. But what I learned here in the process of making this book was that get the children before they've been set in stone with the insecurities that I have. So I had insecurities about my Santa being othered. The children don't have that yet. They're still just kind of like, hey, this is great. So... Don't assume that uh, you can't create a beautiful, safe story. Even if there is strife in the background, create the safe place so that a child has that North Star to look to. That's what I learned. And I'm going to take it forward with everything else I write is to never presume that anger or pain is not malleable or even erasable. Mm. I like that. What motivates you to write? I don't know. I just am obsessed. It's really fun. Oh, you say it's, it's like, like an obsession. So oh, yeah. Me. I'm just, assuming it's like you. What motivates you? I mean, you're here. You love this. <laughs> you love what you do. We're very fortunate yeah, to get to do yeah. what we do. It's true. It, it is. But there, it, it's still a drive. Some, you know, it's, I mean, it, it's like a trigger. So if, like, when, you, when I write... There are certain things that might catch my eye or I see something on TV or driving down the road and I see it. That, oh, that's something great. And then thank God for technology. I try to use the technology. I use the phone to record it so I won't lose that thought or that idea. You know, that, and that's what kind of inspires me. And then from there, you try to build upon the idea of whatever that might be. In this case, we're, you know, the book as far as writing. Do you, how often do you write? Do you write daily or is, is there a certain type? Do you go through any any quirks of writing 
to, to I write to daily, point. but in large bursts, do I complete okay. a project? And I often am writing in my mind. So I also, I'm the New York Times' product reviewer for beauty and health products for their wire cutter vertical. So I'm always, I write in different ways, which I find to be very helpful to not get my brain so stagnated. So I'll yes. write reviews. So I just did this whole really fun review on Santa hats to promote my book, which was really great. Um, this was my winner of the Santa hat winner. <laughs> and, I like the um, color. I like the color of the hat. It's not it red, nice? red. It's, it's almost like it's, it's burgundy. It's velvet. It's just, it's a great, it, it's just a great hat. And let me tell you, there are some stinkers out there. <laughs> Uh, but for my writing process, I'm constantly looking at life and seeing where we can do better in terms of how we represent people. And one of the fun things I like to do is when I talk to someone and we're talking about something and they come out with something that's very emotional to them. And I think about it, I'm like, you know what, maybe you should write a book on that. You know, maybe you should write a picture mm -hmm. book. I like to be like the underground railroad to people's books because I was very fortunate to have people who believed in me as a writer because that's not everybody. There's so many amazing writers out there. And then someone told them, you need to come up with a better career than that. And right. uh, that's true. I mean, I'm, my heart is broken because of that. And because there's no better career than being a writer. You just need the right connection. That's true. Who, with that being said, Name a couple of people who really inspired you to even, you know, going down this path of writing for it, for any genre, because it from the books to, you know, for product review to everything you've done. Oh, goodness. That's a long list. Deneen Milner. Uh, she is an incredible person. I don't know her, which actually most of the people that I don't know her very well. Most of the people that I admire, I admire from afar. And that's right. why everyone listening should always know that you don't know who you're touching. But I just remember, I just remember, I've been watching her for years and she's such a good mother. She's such a good business person. She writes, so she, you know, has, she co-wrote like Steve Harvey's book and she does all things. She's just like everything. And now she has her own publishing imprint and she embodies to me and she, she's behind amazing books like Crown and mm -hmm. um, uh, right now she has, an, there's another, there are a few stories that feature Black Santa this year. She's got uh, Carla Hall's Carla and the Christmas Cornbread. There's also Tiffany oh, Jackson's wow. um, Santa in the City. It's very exciting. Uh, so they're just, yeah, she's definitely on the top of the list of people I've been watching as just like role models. Right. You, we talked, you mentioned it briefly about, you know, writing. Um, black authors, how important are there to be black authors in any genre of books so that our, you know, our people can read them? How important is that? I mean, how important is it to be black, like underline, like <laughs> that's like one of those fill in the blinks. The thing is, we've always <laughs> been there. We're doing it all. It's just that it was always the work has frequently been mm -hmm. um, the credit taken or um, presumed by others because history is created um, by the winners, right? And the perspective mm. of the winner and has been for a very long time, non-black. Mm. Thanks to so many people who have fought to get us to this point and are still fighting. We now are taking the modicum of power that we have, that we have and we've all fought for and snowballing it, right? And so I think that it's very important for anyone listening who feels like they have a story to tell to figure out how to tell it. And there's never been a better time than now. Yes, I like that. And now, now is the time. And you're right. There are a lot of books that are out now by authors of color, black, especially females. Females, I think, are really taking a hold and found a, a, a sweet spot in the literary field. Because that's why I'm they're... constantly, I'm constantly, I'm, I fuss on so many black men. I can name <laughs> so many black, cause like my thing is, I think people don't even think about picture books and it's like, yeah. a, I, per, I consider it to be, when I say low hanging fruit, I think it's a little less daunting and more accessible way to Correct. get into the publishing world. So I listen, I frequently will tell, like, for example, I have a very dear friend who is the son of an imam. And I was like, you need to write a picture book that I would love to see this picture book. You know, and it, you know, so, <laughs> and, but the thing is, you have to want it. And, but there are yeah. a lot of really incredible men who are 
just blowing minds with their great books. And also there are also an, a bunch of amazing male illustrators that are, are kicking yes. butt and taking names but the thing is we're all bringing each other up together um and i think that what we're seeing now is the wave of effort because as we know i think they're going to be i can think of a few now there are going to be a, some really great picture books by black men coming out in the next year because everything that was put in place two years ago is now coming out so i've been working on this book for a couple of years in my oh, head, wow. I've been working on this book for my, like a decade, but and I, it took four years before Bedtime Bonnet came. So I think the wave will be more men with, with the perspectives needed. And also men are killing it in middle grade and nonfiction. So Yes, I know quite a few. I, I know more male authors in the YA genre than any, in any other area. Yo, I should say young adult books. Uh, question, you said, what's the process? You said it took four years for your first book, two years for this one. Walk us through, kind of give us a, you know, a synopsis of what that looks like. What is it, what it, from start to finish, what does it typically take for an author to, to just get to that point uh, so they won't be discouraged if they are trying to write that picture book or any book? I think that's a really good question because one of the things I tell everybody that I mentor is that you got to prepare to have a long runway because you're going to be taxiing for a while and then all of a sudden, boom, it'll take off and you just didn't have your seatbelt on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you don't have enough gas, you're not going to make it off of the runway. You're just going to sit there and be upset. So, and, and no, and like, I was not aware. I mean, I've got deals. I've got deals that, I swear to goodness, have taken the better part of five years. My manager is wonderful. And she currently has like four or five movies going right now. And she laughed because she, I was just like, congratulations. She was like the average gestation of most of these things is over a decade. I started working on them over a decade ago. Wow. <laughs> uh, but the ROI works out and she had runway. So with, for example, I wanted to do a children's book. I, came up with a bunch of terrible children's book ideas, probably, I don't know, 10 years ago. It never really got off the ground with any of those. Did They really didn't mostly leave my, they only half-heartedly left my, uh, my computer screen. And then <laughs> I went on a business trip. I was giving a speech somewhere and my daughter at the time was two or three, I believe three. And she had just started, you know, her hair, I'd put them in little braids. And I was like, okay, great. And my husband, hair love had not yet come out. So he wasn't up to like how to do this. And I thought it was going to be fine because I'd put them in some good braids. We were going to be able to last a few, a few, you know, days. It's going to be fine. But he didn't understand the importance of the shower cap. <laughs> oh, and everything would, everything oh. would arrive. <laughs> So I get there and it's all tangled and matted. And I was like, oh my God. So I started trying and my mom, my daughter's screaming. I was like, this is not going to work. I can't do this. I live in California. CPS will be called on me. And so I literally <laughs> got on a plane. I always was looking for an excuse to visit my mama anyway. So I got on a plane, brought my daughter with me to grandma, where grandma, you know, put her like she's, and she just got, you know, she was gentle, but she was firm, just like a 1960s educator. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, no, you can't let your children run over you. You had to comb through this hair. Of course, my daughter was upset. And then as soon as it was over, she went right back to loving grandma. But she, my mom looked at me. She was like, your daughter needs a bonnet. So I was like, okay, how am I going to explain this to my daughter? Because I tried to get her a bonnet. She was like, I'm not wearing that. You and grandma are like old people. Because she didn't see any of her friends wearing bonnets. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, how am I going to do this? And so what I did is I went to Amazon and I was searching up bonnet books and then I went on Etsy and searching up bonnet books and I could not find a single book about this ubiquitous black experience and it's like a coming you know like there are books there's so many books about everything else there wasn't a book about the bonnet and I knew at that moment that that was going to be my first children's book so unlike the other terrible ideas where I was half-heartedly like if I got one rejection I was like ah, I would just you know move on this one I took very seriously even though no one I was presenting it to ever fully understood it but they helped me finesse it until it was very, uh, my manager helped me finesse it until it was ready to go out to publishers. And then it happened to coincide with my, my publisher meetings 
at the same time as my first, um, my, my most recent nonfiction book, Pregnancy OMG, came out in 2018. Mm -hmm. So I was in New York. I was having the meetings. And I got some no's. And interesting, I got, you know, I got some no's. And I got some maybes. And I got some curiosity. Uh, but unlike with the other books where I was more half-hearted about them, I was much more um, comfortable being a little pushy with this one because I knew it was needed. And so that's why I was a little bolder. And I was just like, okay, so what's the hold up? And they were just like, we don't know if all black women. I was like, go ask some black people. And it ended up, they were very sweet. They, were, they went and asked some black people. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I was able to sell my book. And then you get the illustrator and then it has to go to print. Then it has to make it into the stores and then it comes out. And it's all in all, generally speaking, a picture book is going to take two years, maybe two and a half. A nonfiction book that has no pictures and can just be printed on paper frequently mm -hmm. is a year and a half to two years. OK, so do you do you recommend for that that uh, inspiring author to get a manager or a lit literary agent to to help them to pursue this? I quest? recommend you join a bunch of free Facebook groups for self-publishing people. And I will tell you why. For one, self-publishing is not the weird thing it was before. It's an amazing outlet for picture book people in particular. That Why I say that is that you can find critique buddies to critique your manuscript, which is the same process as if you were to go the traditional published route, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you can also learn more about this industry and decide if you want to self-publish or if you want to traditionally publish. If you want to traditionally publish, that's great because you've been in these great groups on Facebook, um, you know, that have not cost you anything where you're all working towards the same goal and you're learning and you're, you know, your colleagues, you have a manuscript that's ready to go and solicit um, an agent or manager. And I, with picture books in particular, I've never seen it. This is so the time because you can go on, you can go on, uh, like Twitter has like these things called PB Fest. They're constantly soliciting people. People actually do have windows where um, they accept unsolicited, unagented picture books. Agents mm -hmm. have windows. Agents have on their websites what they're looking for. Uh, so picture, that's why I like picture books. Unlike a nonfiction book, which is a whole other can of words, it's a whole other conversation. It's so, it's just a, a, a great way to kind of get out there and it's actually possible. So I would suggest Start as though you're going to self-publish. Get a manuscript ready. If you decide in the process you'd like to go the traditional route, because self-publishing, you can have a book from the, your idea to um, the store in like eight months. But that's a whole other, whole other can of worms. We don't have time for it today. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but if you work on that process and then decide you want to do traditional publishing, you have done the work that you need to do to get traditionally published. Okay. Outstanding. Before we go, can you can you read a, a favorite uh, passage or two from the book for us? Sure. So sweet. Okay, I will read a passage from my book. Who is your illustrator? Who illustrated your book? Oh my goodness! Oh my god! How do we not mention my incredible illustrator, Charnel Pinkney Barlow? She is the um, a granddaughter of the um, recently deceased legend Jerry Pinkney. Um, oh, it's, wow. it's, yeah. it's, it's absolutely incredible. I was so lucky to have her on this book. Um, okay, so I'll just read the first few pages. Like, I love, love, love Santa. His happy face is all over our home, sitting on our Christmas tree, smiling on my gift wrap, and stitched onto my sweater. And then on this side, mom is doing a craft with the daughter. And then one more page. Santa's on our mailbox on our front door, even on grandma and grandpa's car. Every Christmas Eve, my grandparents drive to our house and spend the night with us. It's one of our family traditions. And I think this was important to me because having family traditions is something mm. that we don't have as many of because of a variety of reasons, most because our families were torn from us. And so generations of legacies were left behind seeing my husband who's indian american and so many traditions that have been held together for hundreds of years mm -hmm. in the same family and in my family i did not get to celebrate with all of my grandparents because many of them died at an early age from mm -hmm. generally stress related issues whether it was a heart disease or other things 
Um, right. I think it's very important for this next generation. They understand you now, you are creating family legacies that will last hundreds of years. You're creating traditions. You are safe and you are loved and you are all together. Awesome. I love that. For, oh, before we go, look, there's a few fun things here. Um, so, since it's the holidays, your favorite holiday traditional thing that you're going, that you, you already know you're going to do, what is that going to be? We pop popcorn and we make popcorn necklaces. And we string it on the tree and it and it's very cute and janky, but my kids, <laughs> since they were time, they were the very little, you know, and it was very yeah. exciting to have the sharp needle. And then like as they got older, we started like figuring out how to like dust little colors on it. And it's the jankiest thing on my tree, but it's the thing that's most special to me because it's really fun to sit around, pop the bowl of popcorn, eat it while stringing it. And most of it ends up in our mouth and not on the string. But right. it's super fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, any favorite uh, holiday music? Oh, my goodness. Anything by The Temptations, The Drifters. I knew you were going to say that. I knew he was going to say I mean, that. Who, I mean, again, like, who do you think you're talking to? Like, <laughs> <laughs> is there some alternate? I mean, I no, mean, it's I no guess alternate. There's, there's no alternate. No alternate. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no alternate. All right, favorite traditional food, holiday food. Stuffing. Say it again. Corn. <laughs> I said it in a cornbread stuffing. Cornbread stuffing. Cornbread stuffing. Who makes it? No, I do. I mean, that's oh. the whole thing. Okay. I've, I have, Grandma has relinquished the cornbread stuffing responsibility to me. It's very exciting. It's a whole ordeal. Okay. It's a lot, I mean, because we make a lot. I mean, we make that. It's nuts. Yeah. But it's not just cornbread. It's very complicated. It's not complicated, but it's labor. It's just time consuming to, yeah, just making dressing alone takes time. You got to cook the cornbread. You got to do everything in advance. You got to crumble so, it. It's so much Got to crumble it. Got to season yeah. it appropriately. So then you have to make, anyway, so that's that's my favorite because so of the it, so, memories. So when do you start making your dressing? That's a great question. Well, so um, usually we start, we do it twice, Thanksgiving and Christmas. It has right. no, there is no expiration date or time. It just has to get done. I'm not doing it here in Los <laughs> Angeles because right. I'm also like getting fit, Nance. I'm like on my health kick. So we're only doing, like, <laughs> we're only doing stuffing with my mommy in Virginia. Okay. But we'll do it at some point between the 11th and the 22nd. Okay. All right. Ladies, if you can hold up the book for me one more time, please. Here is the book. This is the book. We have been talking with Nancy Red, the author of The Real Santa. It is currently available on blackbookstore.com and wherever else you purchase your books is in time and available for the holiday. So it's a great book to sit around the fire, to read to the children, leading up to the big day of Christmas. We want to thank Nancy for joining us today. And Nancy, before you go, let everyone know your social media, where they can find you and follow you. Oh, it's everywhere at just my name, Nancy Red, R-E-D-D. So Nancy Red with two Ds. Awesome. We thank you very much, Nancy. Continue being creative, continue writing and inspiring people of all ages with all of your work. And we cannot wait to see more stuff to come out sometime in the near future. But right now, the book to pick up is The Real Santa, just in time for the holidays. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. I appreciate all that you do.